Diana, Princess of Wales, and Sarah, Duchess of York, have not been seen together officially since their last appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace at Trooping the Colour in 1991. Since that moment, both their marriages have ended in separation. Once, the world was enthralled by scenes like this, ignorant to the reality that two of the world's most famous royal women were unhappy in their marriages to the Windsor boys, Charles and Andrew. Now living separate lives and no longer part of official royal activities, Diana and Sarah have chosen an independent lifestyle as single mothers. Diana, as mother of the future King William, can never turn her back totally on the royal family. Yet only six months after her separation to Charles, her life took on the poignant role of a lonely princess. At Lord Linley's wedding to Serena Stanhope, Diana appeared as a lone figure. Not yet divorced, she was prevented by royal protocol from appearing on the arms of another man. At traditional family turnouts, like the Queen Mother's birthday, both Diana and Sarah are now conspicuous by their absence, leaving their solitary menfolk to highlight the state of their respective royal marriages. Yet, for the sake of the children, Sarah and Andrew do appear together. At their daughter's school sports day, they're both present to give their support and participate in all the activities, including the parents' race. In the absence of a normal family life, Diana is compensating her children by showing them a more relaxed style of monarchy. As a single mum, she enjoys their company on a day out at Thorpe Park, a popular theme park near London. Diana is now out on her own. Officially independent of Charles, she's determined to maintain a high public profile and continue an active role supporting her charities at home and abroad. On a visit to Nepal shortly after their separation, Diana reasserted her position as a powerful focus for her charitable activities. Her energetic and compassionate way has become her trademark. Despite the sadness of the marriage breakup, Diana continued her public duties, bringing a sense of style and glamour to her many public appearances. Between all this, though, there's the reality that her marriage to Prince Charles is over. The family unit has been split down the middle and reunions are now centred around the two crown princes, William and Harry. As loving and caring parents, Charles and Diana get together when duties permit for occasional visits to their sons away at boarding school. For Sarah, the regular morning ritual of taking her children off to school hardly raises a flicker of interest. Between them, the ex-royal wives of Windsor are gradually slipping off the public stage, a position they once commanded so notoriously. They married into royalty only to reject its privileges and values in favour of a simpler, quieter and more honest life. The story of the royal wives of Windsor captured people's imagination and enthralled millions the world over.
150 years ago, Queen Victoria visited Aberdeenshire on the River Dee in Scotland and fell in love with its very special beauty. Since then, British monarchs have made it their summer retreat. When Queen Elizabeth comes to stay on the estate of Balmoral Castle, her family come too. Traditionally, it's been a place to relax and hide. But in the summer of 91, cracks began to appear on the unblemished facade of the family get-together. Rumours spread of royal marriages in trouble. When Prince Charles, heir to the throne, married Diana, he brought his beautiful young bride to Scotland on their honeymoon. Alas, their loveless marriage ended in separation after 11 years. The Queen's second son, Andrew, married Sarah. Within a few years, strains began to appear in their relationship too. After nearly six years, they separated. Sarah moved out of the family home with the two young princesses. She realized there was no hope of trying to salvage her stormy marriage to Andrew. The pressures were too much for these young women. They married their Prince Charmings to discover that life within the Royal House of Windsor brought loneliness, unhappiness, and despair. On a trip to India, shortly before the official breakup of her marriage, Diana claimed that the Taj Mahal, built out of one man's love for his wife, was a healing experience. In 1981, Charles had been here himself and had vowed to return one day with his new wife. But when she eventually came, she was alone, a poignant sign that their love for each other hadn't survived the test of time. In the months leading up to her official separation from Charles, Diana projected the image of an accomplished, confident woman, a successful member of the royal family in her own right. Eleven years earlier, their marriage was the royal event of the decade, the wedding of the century, the stuff that fairy tales are made of. She vowed to love and honor, but not to obey. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. By falling in love, this shy 20-year-old took on the responsibility of having to play a major role in the royal family firm, as well as providing her husband with heirs to the British throne. She was now public property. Wherever she went, millions of eyes would now follow. The British monarchy is a closed shop except through marriage. Initiation is a tough business, particularly for a commoner. When Sarah Ferguson, Fergie to her friends, married Prince Andrew, like Diana, she had to learn the ropes for herself. Sadly, she too ended up alone. Sarah had tried to do it her way and failed. She too had hopes and dreams, and like Diana, she made promises. But at 26, she was expected to bring a greater maturity to the role of royal bride and consort. She was given away by her father, Major Ron Ferguson. In later years, he would become the man she would turn to for advice in the absence of her husband away at sea. At the marriage ceremony, they swapped wedding rings. She agreed to obey, saying, I think it's the man's role to be the leader, and he will make the final decisions. But that does not mean I'm a yes woman. I must stress that. They made an attractive couple, Andrew, the dashing naval officer, Sarah, his exuberant partner. She was a breath of fresh air in the stuffy royal circles. Together, they projected a united front. We're a good team, anyway. Yes, I think that's the same grace, is the fact that, that in the last nine months we've discovered that we work very well together. Um, We're and good friends, good team. Quite happy. Very happy. In contrast to the worldly manner of Sarah, Diana at 20 was far more vulnerable than naive. Before the engagement was officially announced, her shyness and inexperience at the mercy of a prying press was very evident. We thought it was going to be announced on his 32nd birthday, but uh, there wasn't. And he told a reporter yesterday that it may be coming soon. 
Have you any comment to make about that? Yeah. Maybe done. <laughs> <laughs> no comment all that. Mm. Did you have a good weekend, though? It's work now. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Questioned on television Charles. before the marriage, Charles and accepted press intrusion as an inevitable part of the job. Twitch. He felt that it was just something you had so to adjust to, and that Diana would learn how to deal with it pretty quickly. That that's part of it. I think if you don't try to work out in your own mind some kind of method for existing and surviving this kind of thing, you, you would go mad, I think. Mm. And so, in the end, you do get used to it. But I don't know, do you find that after the last six months you're beginning to get used to it? Just. Mm. It is, I suppose, one of the most important things you're going to have to adjust to, really, isn't it? Of course, yes. Yeah. Mm. And Prince Charles has been a great help to you in that well, part. Oh, very tower of strength. Diana's shy die image was in sharp contrast to Sarah's mature and extrovert manner. As a professional woman, Sarah had a career in publishing and was confident of her own identity. She seemed far more prepared than Diana for the stresses and strains of marriage in the public eye. At Diana's engagement, the world was officially introduced to a shy kindergarten teacher. Daughter of an English earl, she was unblemished, untrained and inexperienced. Her only expectation was to marry well. In her new public role, the strain began to show. At a polo match shortly before their wedding, Diana was led away in tears, exhausted by the marriage preparations and the constant glare of publicity. But Charles was there to give her support. When their first son, William, was born, 11 months after their wedding, she was happy and relaxed with no signs of strain. Six months later, though, during an exhausting trip to Australia and New Zealand, it became apparent that Diana was losing a considerable amount of weight. Buckingham Palace issued a statement dismissing rumours that Diana had the Slimmer's disease, anorexia nervosa, in fact, she was suffering from an eating disorder, bulimia nervosa. After bouts of massive overeating, most sufferers induce vomiting. But none of these problems tarnish the projected image of a happy and carefree family life. With the pressures of public life, Diana never really gained control over her bulimia. She was now always the centre of attention, forever the focus for a media hungry to give a waiting public the photographs they craved. During official tours, she would go for days without eating properly, pausing only to gulp a chocolate bar. An ambulance had to be called during a visit to Expo 86 in Vancouver. Charles was exasperated after she fainted in public and had to be helped away. Her eating habits found little sympathy with him. Moments later, she reappeared, her composure regained. The royal show must go on. But behind the refined appearance and the thin, pale face was a woman in distress. There were happier times for Diana. When Sarah Ferguson first appeared on the royal scene, she joined Diana and Charles on a skiing holiday in Switzerland. Her appearance confirmed speculation that she was Prince Andrew's girlfriend. For Diana, the prospect of another outsider joining the royal family was a comforting thought. Sarah was a fellow commoner who would hopefully bring companionship and support. The royal family was relieved when Andrew married Sarah, particularly the Queen, who was happy to see her second son betrothed after his many adventures with less suitable companions. She felt that Andrew had met his match in Sarah, boding well for a strong partnership. The couple's own mood of vitality and genuine happiness seemed to rub off, creating an unusually festive royal send-off. Overjoyed at his choice of bride, the Queen never looked happier and more relaxed. It was the last time the royal family would present such a genuinely united front. From 
beginning, Sarah found royal life rather pompous. Skiing was one of her favourite pastimes, and early on in their marriage, the Yorks joined the Waleses on the ski slopes. But for Charles, duty comes first, particularly when cameras are present. There's a definite limit to how royals should behave in public, and it was just too much when his young wife and new sister-in-law were giggly and girly together. On this occasion, it was clearly Sarah's bad influence. Charles obviously thought their conduct unbecoming. On and off duty, Diana enjoyed Sarah's company. In the early days, they were frequent visitors to polo matches, as Sarah's father trained Charles's polo ponies. Later, though, Diana had to officially detach herself from Sarah's unacceptable behaviour, and they drifted apart. As Duchess of York, Sarah embraced her royal duties with enthusiasm. Shortly after their wedding, they left on an official visit to Canada. Sarah's passion for life and general bravado was greatly admired and the young couple's relaxed manner won the hearts of the Canadian people. Obviously still very much in love, they were a huge hit. surprises to come when the Yorks arrived at a farewell dinner in Ontario. They had delighted Canadians with their informality and it wasn't over yet. They were about to rewrite royal protocol on after dinner speaking. The commentator's delightful phrase, it's wild, it's woolly, it's western and good watching. Like my wife. <laughs> Sorry. Before I have my head smashed in, I mean my wife's... I mean my wife's hair. It's at times like these that my speech runs out and I've decided that I'm going to give you a surprise. <laughs> I'm fed up with listening to my voice, so I'm going to hand the lectern over to somebody else. wrong tonight because normally normally I check his speeches and he slipped that in about woolly western whatever <laughs> anyway I could not go through a whole tour letting my darling husband of a year and a day do all the public speaking so we agreed for once <laughs> that I should have the last word tonight you are very lucky to be living here, and I can now count myself, along with Andrew, equally fortunate to be an honorary Canadian. Early in the Wales's marriage, Charles showed off his new wife to the Australian people. Though still very much in love, they made a very different picture to the Yorks. Diana, less self-assured than Sarah, was shy, demure, and acquiescing. She allowed Charles to guide her in every sense. Thank <laughs> you. 
Charles's after-dinner speech in Tasmania was poignant. The last time I was here was two years ago, uh, in 1981, shortly before uh, we were married. And uh, at that time, everybody was saying, good luck and I hope everything goes well and how lucky you are to be engaged to such a lovely lady. And my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, many <laughs> messages. Amazing what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> Hiding behind her prince, Diana was still bathing in the glory of being his princess, and their love and affection for each other shone through. But Diana later became a master of hiding her emotions. She became embittered about Charles's unbending attitude when it came to doing exactly as he pleased, and she confided in friends that they were beginning to drift apart. But to her adoring public, Diana was still seen as a happily married woman supporting her husband. The Spanish royal family were particularly welcoming. They gave Diana the confidence and reassurance often absent in her relationship with Charles. As her confidence grew and her identity changed, so did her image. Her flouncy, girly gowns gave way to a more experienced, sophisticated look, acknowledging her own sexuality and power to dazzle. On state occasions, her self-confidence was overwhelming. Gone was the shy eye image of the past. She no longer ran from the prying eyes of the media, but flaunted her newfound sense of power. Now she was center stage. This was a butterfly bursting out from its chrysalis, now an equal to Charles and no longer needing him to guide her. On foreign tours, Diana now complimented Charles by more than keeping up her end of their official partnership as ambassadors at large. She was now a personality in her own right, striking out and conquering for herself. By showing genuine compassion, concern and love, Diana became the people's princess. Their combined performances were stunning. As the other royal couple, Andrew and Sarah made a handsome double act. Very different from Charles and Diana, it was their relaxed manner that raised comment even during the most formal occasions. Sarah's dress sense also came in for a lot of public attention. When they were together, they reveled in each other's company, but these opportunities were rare. As a naval officer, Andrew was away at sea for almost nine months of the year. Their time together was very precious, and stolen kisses at polo showed their youthful love for each other. But for most of the time, they were forced to live apart, and Sarah found the stress of being alone hard to bear. With a natural zest for life, she needed the buzz of excitement. When Andrew wasn't around, she found life within royal confines rather dull. To relieve the tedium, she took her pilot's license. Flying was a way of life for Andrew, and she wanted to learn more about her husband's work. Not to be outdone, she also decided to fly helicopters. I now know exactly what he's talking about when he goes out on the sorties. So that's what I wanted to achieve. So when he comes back in the evening and tells me what he's been doing, I now know what he's been doing. Alone a lot of the time, home was Sunninghill Park, 
a Texan-style house with swimming pool, sauna and tennis courts. Royal status also meant royal duties, and Sarah performed these in her own very personal and relaxed manner. Her independence and modern ideas were at odds with the formality and protocol of the British monarchy. Living in a gilded cage was not her idea of being royal, and as her privileged position opened new doors, she was quick to grasp new opportunities for excitement and challenge. <laughs> With Andrew away so much, Sarah was often on duty alone. She enjoyed the attention and company of men, and in Andrew's absence, she turned to her father for support, a man she had grown very close to after the breakup of her parents' marriage when Sarah was a teenager. With an absentee husband, the media quickly focused on her performance as a single mum. In 1986, public attention was caught by questions surrounding the state of the Wales' marriage, with press reports maintaining that they were turning away from each other. Newspaper coverage was quick to point out that Diana was very preoccupied with her two small sons. Charles, on the other hand, was spending less and less time with his family. Summer holidays, as guests of the Spanish royal family, was a welcome relief from the confines of British royalty. Prince William felt comfortable in the arms of the relaxed and tactile King Juan Carlos. Prince Charles preferred to keep his distance. Diana, William and Harry enjoyed the easy manner of the Royal House of Spain. Childhood holidays for Charles had never been like this. The concept of familiarity is alien to him. He'd been brought up to believe that royalty must maintain a sense of formality and mystique. When William was rushed to hospital after an accident at school with a golf club, Charles was accused of putting duty before family. Despite the possibility of surgery, he slipped away for an appointment. Naturally, there was strong criticism for his swift departure, and the incident proved that Charles was to blame for his bad image as a father. When William was out of danger, his mother left for an engagement. Diana, how's your son? <laughs> Vivacious and sweet-natured on the surface, Diana has in her character an underlying sense of purpose. With her high public status, she threw her weight behind many social issues. During a speech at a family congress in Brighton, she touched on the importance of the family unit. I could only point to those mothers, fathers and children in lonely isolation or in comfortable conformity who simply do their best with what they have. Their success is measured by the care they have for each other. And I suspect there is no better form of judgment. Diana's concern for family life and the loneliness of others identifies her with women under pressure. She visited wives of soldiers sent to fight in the Gulf War and spoke from the heart. To show you that you are not forgotten, especially at Christmas time. There is nothing, of course, that I can say which will fill that gap in your lives. And to say that I, along with so many others at home, understand and sympathise with you at this time. By visiting AIDS patients, Diana has chosen to take up one of the world's major issues. In 10 years of public neurality, the human immunodeficiency virus has attracted more than its fair share of prejudice and ignorance. Meanwhile, Sarah was doing her duty performing in a style the cameras had come to expect. Unfairly, she was lampooned. Determined to be herself, she chose to support good causes, but in her own way. Her lack of regard for the cool, stuffy royal performance left her wide open to criticism from Buckingham Palace. I'm going to sing a song, and um, I haven't prepared a speech, but I, I just am so pleased to be here today. I mean, it's just wonderful. I mean, it's not very much snow, and I think you've done a fantastic job. There was fierce criticism that her speeches and general behaviour were too unconventional and familiar. The press often made disparaging comments on her dress sense. But 
she was determined to survive the icy disapproval of Buckingham Palace, and her confidence to handle the situation and go yarboo at the establishment was demonstrated by her liberated and relaxed fashion of bare legs, short skirts, and smiles all round. She could never be like Diana, and often referred to her as Miss Goody Two Shoes. Over familiarity with the press was frowned upon. Diana would never have done this. Sadly, Sarah's unguarded manner was to be her downfall. In a fashionable block of flats in London's Chelsea, her passionate nature and zest for life were suddenly exposed to the world when holiday photographs featuring Princess Beatrice and Texan oil millionaire Steve Wyatt were discovered by a window cleaner. Allegations of Sarah's infidelity confirmed gossip that her marriage to Andrew was on the rocks. In the eyes of the establishment, the lonely royal mother had failed to progress from commoner to royalty. Sarah was now convinced that Buckingham Palace was out to get her. When Prince Charles broke his arm in a polo accident, his marriage also took a turn for the worse. Leaving hospital, followed by Diana, he was clearly depressed at the prospect of a long convalescence. The mask of coping crumbled when journalists asked how he was feeling. How are you, sir? For tender loving care, he returned, without Diana, to their Gloucestershire home and into the arms of his close friend, Camilla Parker Bowles. Revelations of their relationship revealed Charles's love for another woman. Diana found her comfort in the company of a friend, James Gilby. Bug telephone conversations, allegedly with James Gilby, revealed just how unhappy she was with her marriage to Charles. But the show must always go on. For generations, the ceremony and privilege of royalty have been carefully maintained to perpetuate the myth that royals are a world apart, something removed and unreachable. At state occasions like Trooping the Colour, the royal family is duty-bound to put on a happy face. A well-orchestrated management system creates this facade. All the pomp and circumstance is an important part of presenting stability and continuity and giving the public what they expect. Prying eyes into her family's personal lives is a phenomenon the Queen finds difficult to understand. Like many of her subjects, the British monarch is typically restrained when it comes to inquiring about other people's difficulties. Keeping up appearances, no matter what happens, is a vital part of being royal. As a mother, the Queen finds it difficult to face up to family problems. She will go to almost any lengths to avoid confrontation. Previous royal generations would have had arranged marriages. Perhaps this method would have been more successful. A bride chosen from one of the European royal houses would at least have known what to expect. All royal family occasions must be seen to be enjoyed. Grandmothers have a difficult enough task holding any family together, even without the constant prying of the media. Under the pressures of a crumbling marriage and in the full glare of publicity, Andrew and Sarah tried to continue with their daily lives. Andrew carried out his duties as a naval officer while Sarah took their three-year-old daughter Beatrice to and from school. After weeks of speculation, the announcement of the York separation was finally made after the Queen's solicitor and a team of lawyers had discussed all the details of exactly how it would be arranged, including the custody of the children. The pressure on Sarah was showing. The palace was angry at the way she had handled her affairs. All of her public engagements were cancelled. She was cast as the baddie in the scenario, but she continued stoically with the daily domestic routines. Forces within Buckingham Palace closed ranks. Stories were leaked that Sarah's extravagant and irresponsible lifestyle had caused the marriage breakup. Now an outcast, Sarah blamed the palace for having interfered in her private life. 
The press wouldn't let go, and it became a war of words. But, as always, the public front was maintained, and such upsets outwardly ignored. Normal royal duties continued. Reports that the Queen was unhappy were confirmed when palace officials claimed that the knives were out for Fergie. Newspaper circulations were boosted as more revelations came off the presses. Sarah owed her public status to that one memorable day when she married Prince Andrew. Now she was suffering the consequences of taking on a job she couldn't fulfil. Branded unsuitable for public life, Buckingham Palace now closed its doors on her. Andrew responded with a round of public engagements, outwardly untouched by all the scandal. Plans were already underway for Sarah to move out of the family house with the two young princesses and into rented accommodation down the road. When asked, he declined to answer any questions about his marriage breakup. The death of Diana's father, Earl Spencer, once again focused attention onto the state of the Wales's marriage. Diana had been very close to her father. At her engagement, he was immensely proud of his daughter and very happy for her. I saw Diana last night. He's looking absolutely radiant. Charles arrived at the funeral by helicopter alone. This was immediately picked up on by the press as another example of their leading separate lives. He then joined his wife and other members of her family at the church. The Spencer family's private grief now became public spectacle as newspapers probed for more signs that Charles and Diana were moving further and further apart. Diana's personal message of love to her father was simple. I miss you dreadfully, darling daddy, but will love you forever, Diana. Still mourning her father's death, Diana and Charles attended his memorial service. Diana blamed herself for not being at his bedside when he died. On a happier occasion, she took her two sons to the premiere of the film Hook. Again, Charles was conspicuous by his absence. Alone without her husband, she is regal yet relaxed. Diana dispenses with stuffy royal ceremony. She knows that her strength and popularity comes from being a princess of the people. Alone again, this time on an official trip to Egypt, her elegant style and uncomplicated manner stands out well against the grandeur of the surroundings. Her visit was a major success. Charles preferred the solitude of a Turkish landscape. Separately, they were happier people. Having first been introduced to foreign tours by Charles, Diana now had the self-confidence to perform solo. Meanwhile, Sarah was getting accustomed to her official single mum status. She'd regained her composure and self-confidence. Even ex-royals must keep up appearances. For Diana, press attention now focused on the more intimate details of her relationship with Charles. Stories were leaked to the press about the real state of their marriage. There were startling revelations. In the face of this unprecedented speculation, the palace insisted that it was business as usual. The princess was doing her best, and hundreds of people turned out to wish her well during her next public engagement at a hospice for cancer sufferers on Merseyside. But her personal unease became very apparent, and the chairman paid her a warm tribute. In all that you do, you reflect so very sincerely the philosophy of tender loving care, which is and always will be the hallmark of this hospice. After all the strain, such praise for her work with the sick and needy seemed to bring her close to tears. It was in sharp contrast to the confident, mature public image she'd cultivated so successfully over the years. Outside, she gathered her composure to chat to the crowds, but then once again her emotions spilled over and she had to retreat to the official car. 
but strength of character seemed to pull Diana through the press houndings and the relentless demands of personal appearances. Shortly after her public breakdown, she appeared poised and elegant at Trooping the Colour, signalling that she was, after all, in complete control of the situation. When the book Diana, Her True Story went on sale, it was clear she had a thorough understanding of her own image protection. The fairy tale princess had suddenly disappeared. Now the romantic image was shattered. Charles was no longer the prince charming of every girl's dreams. He was suddenly accused of being selfish and uncaring as a husband and father. Perhaps his own upbringing was to blame. Diana, too, had a difficult childhood, as her own parents divorced and she missed the warmth and security of a united family. Charles's parents have stayed together, but their relationship with their children has never been close. Being a monarch is a lonely and demanding role. Putting duty first, the Queen regrets she didn't spend more time with her children when they were small. But the Windsors are a close-knit bunch, particularly at a family wedding, when they mustered around cousin Lady Helen Windsor. For the sake of harmony and the cameras, just for one day at least, marriage difficulties within the royal family were put to one side as they all turned out in force. The bride's mother, the Duchess of Kent, welcomed the guests. Sarah had been the one missing wedding guest, but at another marriage, her eldest daughter, Princess Beatrice, was a bridesmaid. The Queen's granddaughter, a new generation of royalty, enjoyed the limelight usually taken by her mother. But Mummy too was heading for more press attention and trouble. After revelations of Sarah's association with the Texan millionaire Steve Wyatt, public interest now centred around another Texan, Johnny Bryan. His cover as Sarah's financial advisor was blown wide open after photographs appeared of the almost naked couple cavorting on holiday together in the south of France. It was a royal expose without precedent, and the world's press had a field day. Sarah's alleged lover, Johnny Bryan, failed to get an injunction to stop publication of the very revealing photographs, and the media onslaught continued. Eventually, Johnny Bryan and Sarah were successful in winning a court battle in France against intrusion of their privacy by the French freelance photographer. Sarah insisted that he was merely her financial advisor and a close and trusted friend of her husband, Andrew. He was, after all, dealing on behalf of and with the blessing of the Queen. No further comment to make in addition to the comments and statements I made last night. Continuing to protest his innocence, Johnny Bryan became the centre of massive public interest and debate. Newspapers claimed that the photographs were published to strip away the hypocrisy surrounding the couple's relationship. The press were quick to tell their readers that the couple had spent holidays together in Thailand, Argentina, New York and Euro Disney. When the story broke revealing Sarah's holiday romance with Johnny Bryan, the royal family, including Sarah, Andrew and the children, were the holiday guests of the Queen at Balmoral Castle. The newspaper headlines exploded like a bombshell at the royal breakfast table. Immediately, the royal publicity machine went on the defensive. Prince Andrew claimed that the photographs were a setup. Stories were hatched that Sarah was suffering from a nervous breakdown. Even the Queen doubted that Sarah would ever be able to shoulder official duties again. The Duchess of York left Balmoral in disgrace. She discreetly drove her children to Aberdeen Airport while the rest of the royal family prepared for church. Sarah had to face the reality that the royal family no longer considered her a member. With her children, she boarded a flight for London and virtual exile.
the official line was that Sarah had always intended to leave Balmoral at this time. Normal royal life resumed in Scotland as though nothing untoward had happened. The royal family, including Prince Andrew, attended morning service at the local church. It was just like any other Sunday, with the crowds coming out to watch. When Sarah arrived at Heathrow, there was little thought of future plans, except to perhaps visit her mother in Argentina. Her main concern was to head for the sanctuary of home as quickly as possible. Outside the gates of her rented home, Romanda Lodge, newsmen were physically pushed aside as Sarah's aides tried to open the gates. It was home at last, but under siege. Back in Scotland, the royal family, led by a waving Prince Andrew, were driven sedately home from church. The palace announced that no significant developments were expected in the next few days. For the moment at least, peace and tranquility returned to the Scottish Highlands. Yet the family holiday was about to be disrupted once more. The privacy of the Scottish estate was again invaded by the press. Transcripts appeared in newspapers of a bugged telephone conversation, allegedly between the Princess of Wales, endearingly referred to as Squidgy, and her friend James Gilby. Their conversation was affectionate, Evidence suggests that the recording was made while Diana was spending Christmas with the royal family at Sandringham in 1989. More illicit recordings would later allege that Charles had had a telephone conversation at around the same time with his girlfriend, Camilla Parker Bowles. Leaving the furor behind them, Charles and Diana left on an official visit to Korea. Even a full-blown Korean welcome couldn't lift the prevailing gloom. The charade was over for all to see. Even Diana, normally a master of hiding her emotions, knew the game was up. But as ever, a sense of professionalism prevailed and the show went on. The necessary demarcation between public duty and private folly was upheld, although the sparkle and life had gone out of the performance. Now it was a case of just going through the motions. Now out of the limelight, Sarah was improving her bruised image. On a trip to Poland for the charity Angels International, she used her high profile to draw attention to sick and deprived children in Eastern Europe. Lucky. The press had come to watch Sarah, but soon found themselves drawn to the plight of children the world had forgotten. For someone who once gained a school award for good service and praise for her cheerful personality and interest in people, it's not surprising that Diana makes an almost perfect princess. Tactile by nature, she promotes the importance of physical contact and family values. Hugging has no harmful side effects. If we all play our part in making our children feel valued, the result will be tremendous. There are potential huggers in every household. Always the focus for hugs and kisses, she represents a new, more accessible type of royal, a much-loved icon the public won't want to give up. Their admiration is genuine, their affection spontaneous. The Royal House of Windsor had been shaken by recent family crises, but not yet broken. It was then with cruel irony that Windsor Castle burst into flames. With so many aspects of royalty already under question, it was as if their home itself was now under attack. The billowing smoke could be seen from more than 10 miles away. The largest inhabited castle in the world was in the grip of a major disaster. The Queen and her sons could only wait and watch as firefighters fought to save what was left of their family home. Andrew was at Windsor when the fire broke out and was one of the first on the scene. For those who saw the blaze as a symbol of a malaise within the very institution of the monarchy, they hadn't long to wait. 
When Charles and Diana attended a gala evening, it was the last time they were seen together publicly, before the Prime Minister, John Major, addressed the House of Commons. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce and their constitutional positions are unaffected. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. memories of two royal marriages were rapidly going up in smoke. A grand spectacle for some, but taking with it the hopes and expectations of a majority who see the British monarchy as a point of stability in a world of change. The Queen attended a banquet at the Guild Hall shortly after the fire and summed up the feelings of a wife and mother whose family and home had suffered incalculable damage. Her comments were poignant. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. The fire's devastation was a sobering reflection of a family gutted by dissent, scandal and bitter accusations. All the Queen's grandchildren are now products of broken marriages. The experiment of bringing commoners into the House of Windsor has failed and royalty can no longer set an example of happy family life. Two young wives have gone and all that's left is the shell of respectability and tradition. It had all begun so well. Royal marriage is off to a good start with spontaneous signs of affection and happiness. Grandchildren, heirs to the throne, and a promised future built on mutual support and public partnership. <laughs> Yet set against the power and ceremony of British royalty, the dreams faded. The husbands failed to live up to expectations, and it was all too much for the wives of Windsor. They were a new breed, young, independent, and unwilling to bow to a system they considered stuffy and outdated. They received little guidance from within the palace and had to find their own way. Neither had set out to challenge time-honored customs, but their effect on the whole image of the British monarchy has been dramatic. Together, they've opened up a new line of questioning on an institution that must move with the times if it's to survive into the 21st century. Maybe the Windsor boys were just stepping stones to a privileged lifestyle, but Diana and Sarah do owe their menfolk something, their status and their notoriety. As the ex-royal wives of Windsor, Diana and Sarah will fight hard to maintain their influence over the children. As mothers to the Queen's grandchildren, they still have an important role to play in the lives of the next royal generation.